For 20 years, Audi produced a naturally aspirated V8 that was both smooth and high revving and made its way into not only a diverse lineup of road cars, but the hearts and minds of its enthusiasts the world over. Here we focus on the five sporting models that received the aluminum beating heart that was the 4.2 liter V8. What we know now as the 4.2 originally started off in 1988 as a 3.6 in the Audi V8 Quattro and morphed into the engine we know and love today. And yes, we know the naming of that particular model is confusing. It is rumored that the 3.6 liter motor that was used in the V8 Quattro is in fact two 1.8 liter Volkswagen motors made it together at the crankshaft. Whether this is true or not, this marks itself as the very first time Audi produced a V8 in any of its road-going models. In the early 90s, Audi went racing with the 3.6 with the modified engine howling at 9,300 RPM and developing over 450 horsepower. Paired with the legendary Quattro system, this led them to a roaring victory across the finish line and thus taking the championship title for several years. In 1991, the number 4.2 that we know and love today appeared as an option in the V8 Quattro alongside the 3.6 liter motor, which quietly folded away into the pages of history. These early 4.2 engines were used in the first generation S4 Plus, S6 Plus, and A8 models until eventually it made its way under the hood of the D2 generation S8. Which brings us to the five coveted Audi sport models we received in the US that featured this glorious powerhouse of an engine. To be clear, these five cars are not the only vehicles Audi sold here in the States with the 4.2 V8. There's also the D2 and D3 A8s, the B6 and B7 S4s, and a few Audi Q models that featured variations of this engine. We narrowed it down to these five as the most exciting 4.2 wielding cars Audi sold here. The lineup of cars that we have here today all contain a 4.2 V8, but aside from that feature, these cars could not be any more different from each other. From wagons and sedans with slush box autos to gated six-speed supercars and everything in between. We truly have a variety of platforms surrounding this one engine. Well, the crazy thing as you join us here is that there is plenty of difference between these cars, not just in the transmissions and not just in the body types. There's also a ton of differentiation in even the engines. We have effectively got three different variations of three different generations of the 4.2 here. But let's not get too far into that today. Let's let the cars do the talking, starting with the first of the bunch, the 2001 D2 S8. Welcome everyone to Genesis, Audi style. This is the beginning of this sequence that we're going through of the 4.2 liter V8 being in sport, quote unquote, Audis. And this is a 2002 D2 S8, the very first that we got here in America. So what about this car then? So this version has 365 horsepower, so a little more than the S6 we're gonna test later, but a lot of other things are the same. So between these two cars that we're kind of gonna be going back to in a minute, they share an engine, a transmission, with just minor tweaks to the camshafts and the heads that make it just a little more powerful in this car, because obviously Audi's not dumb. They know that their flagship car like this has gotta have more power than their plebeian wagon that people are going to buy and with a measly 340 horsepower. And you know what? It works in this car. So this car is beautiful. Just to touch on this for a minute. It is black on black with beautiful Alcantara seats and Alcantara headliner, a solar sunroof that keeps the, in the interior fan going while you've parked it on a hot day, a beautiful sound system, and 18 inch lovely Avis style wheels is what Audi called them. And you know what, it is such a perfect executive sport package. And this was the first time Audi did this. So they took their 4.2 liter V8, which was already here in the States in the earlier versions of the D2 A8, and decided, you know what, 300 horsepower is just not quite enough when we want to create a sport variant. So with all the additions that they did to turn it into the S6 as well, they gave it even a little bit more to give it that oomph that you'd expect. Now, 
Now, the funny thing is, this actually weighs less than the C5S6, which I used to own in daily drive and is also coming next in this review. But you know what, with that extra power, it makes a big difference. And you know, I think that this is kind of where most of this turning the V8 engine into a sports type vehicle came from. Originally, you know, Audi created this engine back in the Audi V8 Quattro days as a 3.6 liter, then enlarged it to a 4.2, and it was originally created to be kind of a luxury car experience. So it was smooth, but it didn't produce much power. It was pretty lethargic. It was meant to just trundle you along. They decided they needed something special. Audi at this time, you know, was at the tail end of them really, really hurting for money because of all the stuff that happened with unintended acceleration in the 80s, where they had some false claims that basically their cars were unsafe and could uh, throttle at any time and kind of kill you, which turned out to be this massive scandal. Well, it hurt the company. For 12 years, they were losing money. This chassis is what saved them. Paired with this engine, I also think this engine was a big help in helping them save them because not now it's not just this little uh, puppy dog kind of playing around. This is a bulldog. So like this actually moves extremely well. It's very nimble. It doesn't take long to rev up. It's actually funny. You can tell the difference in the cams and the heads just by putting your foot down. And I think doing all these changes, getting to the point where they finally built this new chassis between this and the C5 and really trying to kind of force their way forward with this new platform, with a newer variant of this engine and a completely different body design than they'd had for almost 15 years. And so when you think about like what Audi was trying to concoct here, they're trying to concoct, you know, a mission for them to succeed financially and to actually make it continue to make a name for themselves and make this wonderful cocktail of you know, a massive all wheel drive car that actually has some form of performance, which up until that time, really nobody was doing. If you wanted a BMW with all wheel drive, you could get it, but it wasn't in any of their sports models. They were all rear wheel drive. Same with Mercedes. All wheel drive really didn't start existing in sports models until around this time. And I think Audi had a huge influence on that. And that's what started to sell the brand. And I think there's a lot to be said about that. We're gonna talk all through this film about how charismatic and lovely and you know good noises that this engine makes. How all these factors kind of play into why this engine was special despite the fact it not being loved by tuners for lack of tunability. But sometimes this is an unsung hero, I think. When this did so much for the brand and stapled them in the timestamp of history as a car company that was serious. Whereas before they were just a subsidiary of the Volkswagen group. They knew they needed something that could actually take on a seven series, that could actually take on an S class. And honestly, from the bottom of my heart, as much as I love the older Audis, they couldn't. This was the first one with an engine that actually meant business with horsepower with a transmission that functioned. Because prior to this, the automatics you could get were four speed garbage. With a chassis that was pretty dynamic and a design that was finely distinctive and not just a boxy shape that kind of resembled an enlarged Volkswagen Golf. Here's where it sits. As we kind of go on through this progression and we take this engine out, detune it a little bit and plop it into the C5 chassis to look at what it's like in a wagon. I want you to keep one thing in mind. I want you to keep in mind that throughout all these changes that go, that this engine goes through and even changing from a massive 90 degree V8 with timing belt to a 60 degree V8 with a timing chain, that this engine had a significant part in Audi's role. And this is where Audi has started to make the name for themselves that they still have to this day is larger cars that handle any condition, any terrain, with a lot of power. And I don't think it's selling too much to say that this car was one of the pinnacles along with the B5 and C5 with that whole rebranding that went through the early 90s and early, sorry, late 90s and early 2000s that helped save Audi as a brand because they actually started to turn a profit. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. This engine and this chassis played 
probably the biggest sequence in turning Audi into the brand that we know and love today and keeping it here versus getting shut down like you know another Pontiac or any of those other brands that have had their heyday. Audi's not that. Thank God they were able to stick around and stay relevant. Okay, so, the S8. Did you feel like you were in the movie Ronin when you were driving it? Kind of a little bit. I mean, it's, it's that kind of car, kind of the, the good guy, bad guy car. I don't know. It's, sure. It's a, you know, I think we remarked multiple times through us each driving it while filming it that this is kind of a two-faced car. Well, so my greatest takeaway from this is actually that, that thing right there has surprisingly, shockingly good steering behind it. Yeah, now granted, the car did just have a new rack, but even having driven one that didn't just have a new steering rack, yeah. they do drive very well for what would normally be considered an early 2000s luxury barge, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's interesting to see how the steering feel and how direct a, a steering rack or box could be yep. from a car from 20 years ago, from a car built last year. If you hopped in a Toyota Corolla from last year, be like, okay, this is devoid of any and all feeling, and it's just an appliance. And then you hop into an executive, you know, uh, sedan, lu luxury sedan yeah. that weighs almost twice as much as that Corolla. And it's a big difference. I mean, like, and not literally almost twice as much, but, uh, you know, substantially more. You would think that you would just have no steering feel at all, yeah. but I, it's actually very direct and predictable steering. The transmission is not so much no. direct and predictable. So, no. To put this into perspective, and we'll touch on it again with the C5, they have the same transmission. It's called the 5HP24, if anybody wants to know the name. Is that a ZF? Yes. Okay. It's a five-speed with the quattro front drive shaft built into the front. They're, they're an old transmission. I guess if you think about it in, in the time and place where that was originally developed, which was the mid to late 90s, you know, and it was just tuned up until the point that both of these cars came out, mm -hmm. You know, it, it does the job, but it's slow, it is quite archaic, and it, you know, you'll even hear in the bit of the C5 where it decides to take several seconds to downshift. <laughs> it's, it's the nature of the beast when you're going with a slush box that's this old. Yeah, that's and why it, it's a popular thing to six-speed swap these things. Well, yeah, and Audi wasn't the only offender of this kind of uh, archaic technology either. I mean, Porsche's Tiptronic was oh, out at this time, and... <sighs> <laughs> and same with BMW. BMW also used ZFs at this time, yeah. also four or five speeds and et cetera, and also pretty trash at shifting or feeling or any sort of response. Well, and just automatics in general this time. It wasn't even just the Euros. Uh, the fourth gen Outback XT that I had for five years, the car that I remember my parents buying brand new back in 2004. Uh, it's, it's all very comparable, Yeah, very of the period. So you have to keep that in mind with these cars, um, you know, but despite that, I mean, there is one benefit to a slush box like that, which mm. it does help elude the luxury that the D2 provides. Because you don't have to worry about like shifting and like, yes, a dual clutch in quite a few ways can be smoother, but if the auto is functioning correctly, yeah. it makes it super easy to throw into drive and it's smooth as silk. Which is True. more what the D2 is going to be doing 90% of the time anyways. That like really having the S8, yes, you do gain the extra, you know, 65 horsepower over the standard model, which is 300. Yes, you do gain, you know, like some significantly sportier and lower suspension, but it's still going to be a town trundler. <laughs> it, well, and it's interesting, right? Because we can only look through the, the lens of someone driving this car in 2020 yep and not in 2001 so it's it's hard to cut like and by the way this is the, the very cleanest s8 that we could have ever picked we got very lucky with this one and it it does help out with showing off that even this black car from this age with the black and alcantara interior that it has that it's kept like its grace very well what did the mileage uh, say on it what's what's on how much is on the odometer right now? 178,000 which is honestly not bad. No, that's, you know, about technically probably around average for the year. It's the oldest car that we have here, but it's not the highest mileage, mileage. car that we have here. <laughs> but the big thing is the condition of that would lead you to believe it would have about half that mileage. Yeah. Um, maybe even a little less than that. It's been cared for exceptionally well. If you told me that car had 78,000 miles, I would believe you. Yeah. It's very, very incredibly clean. And, you know, both of these cars also come from an era where, like, 
Audi's styling was significantly, so like, look right here, everybody on camera. The RS5 right here, gorgeous and very, very aggressive looking car. It's my favorite. Yeah, now, granted, at the time that the S8 came out, we didn't have the RS6 in the States, but even then, even the RS6 that did come to us at this time, Audi's styling was significantly more restrained and subdued during this oh, period. Yeah. It was not crazy. Um, and that's fine, because I think it lends to the body lines and to the era. It just timestamps these cars very well in their era. The, how, how I look at a lot of automotive design mm -hmm. uh, is also similar to how I look at a lot of watch design. Absolutely. Whereas the cars that are generally busier, have a lot more going on, or a lot more aggressive, mm -hmm. like the watches, tend to not necessarily age as well, yeah. or they are for a very specific buyer. Yeah. Whereas if, you know, uh, the first generation S8 is really more like a Rolex Mariner. It was like a black dial. Yeah, it's classic. It's, you know, people will look at it in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now and say, you still have class yep. rather than like, I, I don't know how the RS5 is going to age in 30 years. Yep, because we're only, you know, not even a decade into its life cycle. No. And these, you know, even the interior on the S8 is still mm -hmm. a pretty timeless thing. They did a good yeah. job with not doing kind of the mistake that a lot of manufacturers made several years later, which right. is throwing screens in that aged horribly. It's funny if you actually, so this is the B8.5 chassis code mm -hmm. for the RS5. And we're going to come back to the RS5 later. But the pre-facelift yep. <laughs> version of this has already not aged well. And no. that's been 10 years. Yeah. About, so. so, I mean, either way. These both, especially the S8, have kept like very well. And if you can find one of these, this is one of the more difficult cars to find at this point in time. Mm -hmm. There weren't that many of them, there weren't that many brought in, and they weren't cared for well. Um, and so being that that's the case, if you can find one and you want something larger that has V8 performance, you're not necessarily that caring about gas mileage, which by the way, fun funny thing, the S8 does get a little better than the S6 behind it primarily due to gearing and the differences between the heads on their engines. Um, but like the difference is a couple miles per gallon. It's nothing much. So this is high market, right? We have a high market car that goes through the banks and goes through the streets, but- Executive, I believe is the word. Executive, yes. yes. Behind it, with its cousin, we have something a little bit <laughs> different. Yeah. We'll call it high altitude. Oh yeah, like, like high market, high altitude. Yep. So. Let's hit the ski slopes. Well, welcome everyone to the C5S6 Avant. This particular car has some, we'll call it major patina. This car, pause and wait for it, has 260,000 miles, soon to be 261,000. And you know what? Despite the little uh, imperfections that we've shown you, it works quite well. And as handled kind of honestly, it's downsides with grace and beauty. This car, you know, being 17 years old with that mileage has seen a lot of things. Um, you know, it's got little things in here, even like this seat bolster being slightly ripped. But you know what? This car has stories. We'll get back to that in just a second. Hello everybody, Future Justin here in Future Justin land. Right at this moment is where my microphone decided to cut out, get really garbled and go all screw wampus. So I'm gonna update you on what exactly I was talking about. This particular car at the time of Future Justin land now has 264,000 miles and has survived most of its life in either the Colorado Rockies or the Utah Rockies. It still sees the ski slopes all the time. It's been properly used as evidence with the lovely body rust that we have going on, as well as the punctured side skirt and all the aforementioned rock chips, rear scratch glass, you know, anything you can think of that happens to a car that gets daily used with this many miles is going on with this. But you know what, that's interesting because it tells that this car has been used as a car that has character. It's got more stories than arguably the rest of this bunch combined because it's been used all the time. It's probably seen more ski days than anything else you can think of. And you know what, I love that about it. It kind of tells the great story of this engine. This engine is, while not economical and not necessarily environmentally friendly or tunable, it is reliable, as this one has never been opened up and neither has the transmission and neither has the suspension, 
uh, you could argue that like, okay, this car has a lot of, you know, little wear and tear items. Yeah, it does. But sometimes those character flaws, as I'm gonna call them, are what gives a vehicle soul because each one has an actual story to tell. Now, this shares a few things with the D2 that we reviewed earlier, namely the engine in basic form, albeit some tuning that turns up the S8 to 365 horsepower versus this at 340. The transmission, which is exactly identical despite the final drive ratios on each of these cars, the S8 has a taller final drive, as well as the basic suspension geometry with some tweaks depending on obviously wagon versus sedan. But this car provides like an interesting prospect of being able to transport, you know, like five adults and two Labradors at 160 miles an hour. And I don't know if there's that much better than that, but there is one downside into this car, which is the transmission on, you know, this and the S8. They are still old school automatics. And right about now is where my microphone decided to start working again. So I'm gonna go back in and continue talking about it. Bye bye from future Justin Land. But it has never been opened up from its factory states. It's got the factory heads, the factory exhaust and intake. Everything is as it left the Audi factory back in 2002 and it still pulls and still works great. It is a workhorse, it's under stress. You know, compared to the modern V8 even that Audi's pumping out, which granted is turbocharged, this is a larger motor that has a lot less things going on for it. There's less to go wrong and you don't have to worry about boost issues or things of that nature. And that's the glory of it, right? This car, especially as the wagon, was designed to be used. And every single winter, Without fail, this thing sees the ski slopes multiple times a week. And that's where all this stuff comes from, right? You've got like this crunched hole in one of the uh, little side skirts right here. You've got the rust going on, like just starting on the galvanized metal, sadly, on both sides of the car on the back, from where the stones kick up, from the massively flared arches on this thing. But, you know, that tells the story. This car, while mechanically very well taken care of, has been used. It has not been a garage queen that's just sat, you know, in inside some climate controlled and dust filtered garage. It's been driven. It's got character. It's got like literally could write a novel on the stuff that's happened to it. And then the transmission decides to do this. The one downside of these cars, both the D2 and the C5 are definitely the transmission. And that is why a proper modification is switching to a six speed, which is great. And I think kind of even adds a little bit more allure to the car, especially with the wagon trip. At that point, you've got a car that'll do north of 150 miles an hour, kill it in any all weather condition, and have a room for five adults, two dogs, no matter the speed, and a ski rack, and anything else you could want with a full wagon with a trunk and everything. But that's kind of where it is. In this car, it's very subjective, right? You've got two extremely subjective things that you have to decide on if this car is like right for you or basically any of these cars. Number one of which is the fact that tunability is not there. You have to accept that this is what the car is and what it's going to be. In this modern world of turbocharging and everything, there's a lot of, that people desire from wanting to push things harder and harder. But I think as we get further and further along in this, the glory will become that like these cars just work. They are less high strung and at this point they're cheaper. I don't think they'll ever appreciate in value really maybe, but who knows, nobody can really predict the car market. I think that they'll find a special place in people's hearts and continue to be appreciated for the linearity that they deliver as far as the power is concerned. The noise is a big thing that's always constantly talked about when you talk about NA versus turbo and the responsiveness. And an added bonus, it's cheap and as long as you do the regular maintenance, pretty reliable. As we get further along in, you know, to the world of turbocharging and efficiency, I think this will become a lot more appreciated than they are. Not Maybe not by value, but kind of by where they stood in the automotive world at the time they were made. And a funny story for those of you that don't know me personally and even more funny for those that do i used to own one of these it was my daily for four years and there's only twice that let me down once was a battery which that's a normal car thing and the second time was when 
a deer decided to run in front of me on the way down to a friend's house. I hit it at 70 miles an hour, and you know what? The thing still drove up onto the tow truck. You know, there's not much of a price you can pay for that. It just worked. It drives great. It has, you know, it's honestly a very comfortable ride. It's compliant. It moves out of its own way good enough. Really, the only thing left to be desired, which kind of goes true for any of these cars, is most definitely the miles per gallon factor. But you know what? You know what you're getting into when you're buying a V8. That's just, nobody's buying a V8 for efficiency. definitely does everything you want a car to do. And that's kind of what happens with wagons, right? Coming back full circle, what we talked about at the very beginning. As this car has proven, this is a car you buy and you use for quite literally anything you need to do in life, whether it's a ski run or a Home Depot run. You got it. And it'll do it and give you just enough fun while doing it to make you smile. It really does hold its own being a big 4,200 pound all-wheel drive wagon. It's not gonna win any races, but it'll win your heart. And I think that's kind of where we're going with all of these cars. Because you can just do this, go around a corner, give it some fun, plant it, 7,000 RPM. You can't put a price on that. Ugh. I just love it. And I think we're gonna continue to love all these cars as we go along. God damn it. So I just got back from the slopes. And? Where'd you go? Uh, what runs did you ski? How's the traffic? Uh, uh, food traffic, was good? Tra food was great. Traffic mm. was horrible. Mm. Things were cold. And Double Black Diamond was hard as hell. Sounds like Park City. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> Which is exactly where we drove and chose to drive the C5 S6 wagon. Which, okay, we're going to get something out of the way right now. This particular car is a little bit tired, but not mechanically. It has had a lot of life lived currently. As you can see, like, and we go over this in the video, there's a lot of little, like, little body damage everywhere. The galvanized metal is starting to corrode. It's got on that uh, driver's side um, side skirt, there's a lovely little hole in it. And this is to no, like, fault of the owner. It is his daily, and a, and a lot of this had already started by the time he acquired it. Um, but here's the thing. Pause. Ben, how many miles does your car currently have on it? 264,000. <coughs> Here's the thing. This car has 264,000 miles on it, and the engine's never been opened, and the transmission's never been opened, correct? And the transmission has never been opened. That's pretty bold. Yeah, yeah, you really have to go 90s Japanese to really get into reliability figures like that, like the 1UZ, like the 2JZ. Yeah, and to be clear, there's obviously other work that's been done along the way, such as a power steering pump and an alternator, you know, all normal things that happen. Yeah. However, the basic mechanicals have stayed functioning. And even the original springs, and we believe, according to the original owner, the original shocks potentially, have never been messed with. Wow. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty okay. solid car <laughs> underneath the tattered, um, you know, we'll call it weather-beaten exterior. It drives really well. Those are the original struts. Y yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly amazing. So with that being said, like, it's interesting to compare the two because this has the same engine, the same transmission, the same basic suspension. There is differences, but the, the design and most of the control arms are extremely similar and even the differential besides gearing to the D2. But it's amazing the contrast that that has. Yeah. They, it does not have the power. It has 25 less horsepower. Yeah, when they kind of weigh as much as they do, I don't think it's necessarily that noticeable. No, uh, but the throttle response is where it is. That's it. Yep, it, which is For mainly sure. down to the intakes and heads and the yep. differences between the camshafts effectively mm -hmm. and the way it takes in air. Right. Um, but like it can be a little lethargic at times um, when you get up into altitude because of that. It still runs great, but like it really is amazing how well these cars have had. And I mentioned in the film, I dailyed one of these yeah. for a long time. It never once left me stranded, except for when the fuel pump died, but at 170,000 like mine was, that's expected. 
Right. But there's a lot of praise there. I love this car. I remember when you had it, um, and we're it's right in sort of photo in this film of <laughs> no. Justin making a face and I'm driving the car and I'm going like this because I like to make fun of your seating position. Yeah. But I digress. Yeah. Uh, I remember driving that car a couple of years ago before you had your Stinger. Yep. Uh, back when it was just that and the Saab. Yeah. The battle wagon. And I was shocked of how flat this thing corners. Yeah, it's they do very well for their age, and they're very underrated, as is almost all of the cars we have here, despite the fact that two are kind of at Halo cars levels. They're not loved by the enthusiast because of the lack of tuning, which we've right. touched on that several times in this film, so we right. won't delve into that right now, just a re-mention. Right. Um, so, honestly, we do need to acknowledge one thing since we've mentioned it with the C5. None of the cars here have actually had any major engine work done. None of them. No. And this is the perfect time to mention that because with the two oldest cars out of the way, those were the two you'd be expecting to have potentially had major engine work. Well, because a lot of the times the class that the D2 generation kind of fills mm -hmm. with the S class of that generation, with the uh, 7 series of that generation, it, a demographic is kind of filled and yep. a lot of times these cars aren't very well taken care of which leads to things breaking yeah and they're also the cheapest cars here so the people that buy them off the used market at this point in time really don't well the, you know, the, do the cleanest d2 in the world even cleaner than this would be what 10 grand no it'd be more than that it'd probably be closer to like 20. Be who 20? knows you know with car prices these days to the right person know. it would be 20. yeah yeah but re realistically speaking they trade hands for six to 12 grand depending on condition and mileage and you can get them cheaper than that when there's when there's relatively a moderate amount wrong with it right. you know but to the right person that's a steal of a deal that you know somebody that can work on it sure so but you know it is interesting looking at the wagon and thinking like okay Audi built this car in a very interesting way. You have a car that can do slightly north of 160. You have it with five adults, a yep. lot about it room. Dog. You know, dogs. <laughs> yeah, there's Not literally, bikes. <laughs> there's literally the normal pullover wagon cargo cover and then a dog separator that also can oh, go up that. in these cars. I love that. And there's, you know, it is a lifer car. It's one of those you can buy. It has just enough sport to be fun, yep. but enough life to be livable in any condition. Yeah. yeah, and this car has seen the slopes. The owner does use it regularly in the winter to ski and snowboard and get around. It is his daily. Hence the one-star snow, uh, snowbird sticker <laughs> on the back. <laughs> <laughs> and really, like, it's honestly, it's amazing. I love it. Anyways, so coming from that, like, we have a little bit of a rift here between this and the next cars. There's a pretty dramatic change. Yeah, so... I mean, so the, the D2 generation yep. and the C5 generation are cars that you really like to associate with mm -hmm. as far as your brand. Yep. Uh, and I've typically been more of a sports car and supercar person. Yep. So uh, you had a good day for sure. I did. Um, but I got to drive an R8 and an RS4. It's a pretty dramatic shift here, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> Get ready because gears are about to go flying in two manual transmission cars. <laughs> Ooh, that was traction light. Uh, welcome everyone to the B7 RS4. This is a car that I've actually really dreamt about driving uh, basically since its inception in the mid 2000s. Uh, I remember Jeremy Clarkson driving it on top gear and remember hearing about how is this a shared motor with a supercar that will be making an appearance later in this video. 4.2 liter, like all the other ones in this video. This V8 makes 420 horsepower, and uh, as near as makes no difference, about 310 foot-pounds of torque. The great thing about this motor, as opposed to the v that we had previously driven in the video, this revs to 8,000 RPM. Holy So due to uh, packaging or some packaging constraints with this car, uh, this engine actually is, has a smaller footprint 
than the engine found in the D2S8 and the C5S6. They, this is the first uh, 4.2 V8 that Audi has made with direct injection. Uh, they move the timing around. So the footprint inside the engine bay of this is actually smaller. You wouldn't know it because <laughs> when you pop the hood, they properly shoehorned this one in there. But back to how this thing drives, this engine is actually really something special. And I'm, I'm kind of sad that they don't make it anymore because it's buzzy, it's light, it's animated. And I've actually been able to basically straight out of the box, nail all the heel toes that I've had today. When it comes to under pressure, driving on camera, flying at Justin at certain speeds for our flybys, insert here. I was just able to just pull up a, a heel toe. And that I don't think has as much to do with my capabilities as the engine's capabilities. We have a six speed manual in here and actually the ratios pair up really nicely. Yes, the gearing is long in here. However, the gear ratios are suited in here because it's similar gear ratios that would be in another car, but you still have like another 1500 RPM more of power band before you hit red line. This is a gorgeous car and it looks pretty fresh. All things considered with miles, it has 107,000 miles and there are a few parts on this vehicle that are pretty much original. Suspension and uh, clutch and shifter bushings and uh, linkage and stuff uh, onto suspension. It's interesting because you can chuck it into a corner here. Let me uh, give it a downshift and I'll chuck it. It grips and the geometry is there and it rotates well enough for a uh, front engine V8 Audi but it just has a bunch of body lean and it kind of makes you feel like you're going a lot quicker than you are. Everything else about the car hides speed really, really well. This car in particular has a stock exhaust. There isn't a whole ton, like a torque hit, like a wave that hits you. So you end up looking at the speed going, oh wow, no, I actually am going that speed. But everything else about the driving experience is actually pretty sheltered. I mean, the engine does bark and it's lively and Getting on it. <laughs> uh, this is a good day we're having up here. This is a real, real good day. The great thing about this is when I get to turn around, that means I get to accelerate from first gear again. And we are on some pretty narrow roads here. So I kind of get to enjoy every opportunity I get to do this. <laughs> yeah, it's direct, steering is direct, and <sighs> the transmission, it's interesting because the linkage in here, it's a little aged. I imagine this car in particular has actually seen some track time uh, knowing who the owner of this car actually is. When we say all original and factory, we actually mean it with everything about this car. The brakes I'm sure have been done by now, and the tires that are on it are actually pretty fresh. But aside from that, everything else is actually original with this, which is honestly, as someone who tries to wrangle cars and network with cars and find cars to put on camera for this kind of review, this is my wet dream. This is everything I ever want out of trying to find a car because this honestly does feel like a time capsule. Some of the things have aged uh, slightly as far as the handling, which the struts on it are original as 107,000 miles. But with the shifter and the suspension, this is honestly a coilover setup and a short shift kit away from actually being perfect. While we're caught in traffic, I can tell you that this is one of two RS cars that are on here. This is actually quite a special car and Audi wanted you to really know that. Uh, the spec of this car is actually pretty unique. There is carbon everywhere. There's carbon in the engine bay. There, hell, there is even carbon back here. There's heated rear seats and the surround around the controls for the heated rear seats, there is carbon. 
and Audi really wanted this to be a special car, and I honestly think that they nailed it. I would love to have another go with this after the suspension has actually been addressed, because at that point, this is really one hell of a car. You can do a whole ton of damage uh, hauling through a canyon road or uh, doing track work. So with this being an RS car, this engine in here, this 4.2 that has been coveted so far in this video, this is at this point in time, the most aggressive version of that. But this car in particular, with it being an RS model, with all the carbon fiber, with the 8,000 RPM red line from a V8 that's in a sedan and a six speed, this ain't gonna happen again. And so I feel incredibly grateful of the owner. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for letting us take your car for the day. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous vehicle. This blue is out of this world. The haunches from the styling department at Audi, they did a marvelous job. This car is still kind of a sleeper, even in the blue, like some people notice and coming up this road that we have here, some people have moved out of my way, which has been, thank you. If you don't know what it is, you probably won't care that much. You'll go, oh, that's a really pretty blue on that Audi. And that's kind of the end of it. Whereas to those that know what this is, people who have driven them, people who have lusted after them for decades on end, this is really something. Like I said before, this car really is a suspension tune away from being basically perfect. This B7 RS4 is absolutely a moment in time car, as some other people have put things like the BMW 1M Coupe, uh, the GT350R, various vehicles of that nature. This is definitely a moment in time vehicle that hopefully will be appreciated later, uh, but this is not happening again. If this engine was louder, this would really be an in your face brash daily driver, which I'm not exactly against. There's another car actually that has been known that paved the way for some things. It actually pioneered this huge trend that we've had for the past almost 15 years now of people daily driving supercars. Let's see what that's about. So Gavin just mobbed an <laughs> RS4. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. You did. Um, so we'll start off with a couple cliff notes. This was the first Audi that would be, you know, as the driving enthusiast would be called, dynamically competitive. It's interesting you bring that up because this was actually aimed more in response to the E46 M3, which is still even heralded in today's time as a dynamic and capable uh, performance coupe. Yeah. And so obviously it, you know, it went on a crash diet, not as much necessarily in weight, but more in proportional sizes, engine placement. Yeah. Things got a little more compact. The engine changed massively, where yes. we went from a timing belt driven uh, V8 to a timing chain driven V8. Which sings, it sings, man. It sings, and we also transferred from, you know, horsepower and torque figures that were not that far off and relatively right. equal right. to definitely more horsepower driven. Yeah, it was 420 mm -hmm. horsepower. We're cranking it up to more of the higher end. It sings well, it dances well, and to quote a lovely auto journalist who's very famous, um, dare I say it might be better than an M3? I think of that era and mm -hmm. of that vintage, I completely agree. Uh, this car that we actually have here, with the exception of the BBSs that are on it, is all original. The, the thing is completely stock. Yep. No, there, there's a factory exhaust on there. So actually, the balance of the, uh, the tone that the engine creates yeah. and the li balance of that and with livability, I mean, it's no surprise that this is the, the owner, this is their daily. And what's funny is this is the one car we had on shoot that you could hear the car coming from the front better than the rear because the induction noise is so loud. God, I'm such a sucker for induction noises with the Miatas, with Audi motors, I'm, I'm about it. Yeah, so this made a massive generational change in the way that kind of Audi started to design their cars going forward. There was, you know, everything, there was a few things carried over, but everything from chassis to body design to subframe design to the engine, the trans, etc. It was more or less a new era for Audi in general. Really. Yeah, there, there was a lot of stuff that got 
a, you know, a new leaf was turned mm -hmm. with all this, mainly starting with the B6 technically compared to B5 and we, earlier. We don't talk about that car. But we, don't. we glossed over that. There's a reason we didn't include the B6S4, <laughs> and that's because it's, you know, to the average person, too similar to a B7 RS4, and why would you not have the better variant out of the two? Absolutely. No, so, for sure. For sure. So we chose that, and, you know, this particular car, as Gavin mentioned, is such a time machine because of how well it's been kept. It's, yeah. you know, as he said, it's still got its original, you know, suspension, which is starting to get quite tired. It's, yeah. you know, it's the factory adjustable suspension. There is an S button in there. Yep. I hit it back and forth and back and forth. I didn't notice anything in the suspension. Yeah. The it's, engine, it, I think, changed a little bit, but that was really it. Yeah, there's not too much. I mean, but, you know, this is, this is the first car we have here that is considered to be more or less a halo car. Yes. It is out of, you know, effectively we have two of these. We have the RS4 and the R8, which are very heralded as, you know, they're um, by high ranking, not only automotive journalists, but enthusiasts that can afford a slightly more expensive, you know, but depreciated used high-end car. Right. Love these things right. because they do perform. And they're, yeah. you know, also very livable. The thing that I find interesting, uh, didn't have as much to do with the actual driving impressions yeah. of these cars. Uh, maybe it's the color, maybe it isn't. But the thing about comparing photos that I posted to Instagram, and yep. I can even have an insert in this video yep. of this, more people reacted to the RS4 that I posted than the R8. And maybe it's because the R8 isn't the crazy color, maybe because it's the first gen, maybe it's because 10 year olds have been looking up Audi R8s for the last 10 years now, and they're not as interesting on the internet. Maybe it's because they're overplayed, you know, because of that, you know. Who, who knows? But um, either way, I do think like it does end up striking oh, yeah. a lot of people. And I yeah. mean, I guess there's also the crowd that loves the fact that it is a four door sedan that has effectively the same motor as the R8 with changes to dry sump and a few other noteworthy exceptions. Right, right. But, you know, you have what, you know, at the time, some people would have called a supercar motor. Quote right. on, in quotes, please bear with me. Even though the RS4 came out first. first. You know, <clears throat> and so it's, and, you know, this is also the first time where we basically met at this point, 100 horsepower per liter. Yeah. And, you know, that's a pretty big number from an NA engine. Only a few other cars have really done that. There was the S2000 yep. that did it first and then the E46 M3 that did it and then the RS4 did it. Yep, and then, you know, obviously these days that's a lot more common, but that's turbocharging and direct, and, you know, direct NA cars, injection and all the new things that NA come cars out. don't really do that except for maybe a couple Ferraris. And that's it though, Yeah, that's it. There's, it's a pretty good thing. Now, um, kind of one thing I wanted to touch on, this, this was definitely, you know, with the exception of the RS4 and the R8, an interesting time for Audi, because there was a big generational leap where we changed from the D2 and C5, which had a definitely a more classic resemblance to the mid-90s Audis, and even some not so close resemblance to their even earlier counterparts, to kind of a whole new um, time. So there's a pretty big generational leap with engine, with transmission, and as we mentioned, like this is a manual car. This is not an automatic one, thank God. Um, the RS4 is. <laughs> yes, the yeah. RS4. And it really makes the car. When you have a high revving engine like that with a manual transmission, whereas Audi had been pretty hell bent for the most part in their sport variants before that coming in automatic, which was tragic. Auto tragic. Pathetic. <laughs> yes. Um, this is where we did start to see some manuals a couple times from Audi going forward yeah. until we reached an entirely different thing in this car, which we'll talk about later. And it, you know, it really is amazing to look at that and see what they did mm -hmm. and um, see like how this car's aged and held up well and how, you know, it, it still is performancely competitive even today. I would, as far as stats and figures go, if you are the greatest racing driver of all time, then yes, I feel that driving a car, uh, vehicles of that yeah. particular vintage, where yeah. it is kind of mid to late 2000s, yep. I feel like that's more of a balance between uh, chassis dynamics and driver involvement and driver experience mixed yeah. with daily livability. Yep. Yeah, it was a lot more balanced than something, you know, some of the newer stuff, AKA the thing we'll reference later again. Um, there's a pretty stark difference, but also there, you know, 
a little more difficult. We do have more creature comforts in the newer stuff. So that's lacking a lot of them. It does have traction control and ABS and your basics. But overall, I mean, it's still a manual car. It was one of the last of the era, along with the R8, despite the fact of ABS and traction control, that were still pretty manually driven cars. Yeah. And not just because of the manual transmission, but you know, just chassis dynamics versus electronic dynamics is what we'll call it. Well, yeah, and a solid amount of power distribution between front and back, and mm -hmm. you know, th not as many things were as adjustable on the fly or yep. through a computer. Or driving mode selection, which is you know, a big thing right, in right. You know, modern cars. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's a reason that it is loved for what it is. It's a, you know, it's a fairly reliable car cons compared to the, B the aforementioned B6, which has its own noteworthy issues and even, you know, BMW's offerings because at the time that that launched was right in between when E46 went to E90 and that was a drastic difference. It was huge. <laughs> yeah. was drastic difference. E92 was just said, here, hold my beer. Exactly. And then they had 8,400 RPM red line. Exactly. So a big change. And luckily, that ended up pinning this car in history. As Gavin mentioned, like, for whatever reason, whether it's the color of this particular car, which is gorgeous, oh. or whether it's the fact that it is still well heralded in, in circles as this Halo car, here we stand, you know, 13 years later, and it's still talked about. Yeah. Well, speaking of things that are still talked about, let's go, wait, let's go back in time yep. to a different kind of vehicle that started it all. Uh, a vehicle that pioneered the daily driven exotic. Mm -hmm. uh, a supercar that you could drive year round, whatever climate condition you were experiencing at that point in time. Brings us to the R8. Oh my God, this is something else. Welcome to the 2009 Audi R8 V8 manual. This has been one of the best days as a wannabe car journalist I've actually ever had. We're up here in Wolf Creek. The colors have been changing with the leaves. The road has been mostly our own. And I have this soundtrack behind me. Okay, so let's go back to the numbers. 4.2 liter, naturally aspirated V8, 420 horsepower. Same as that's in the RS4, that's because it actually is the same engine. The only thing that's changed is the fact that it uses a dry sub oil system and the position of the motor mount so it can fit a mid-engine setup. That's it. Everything else is more or less the same. And it's funny because the engine builds revs closely to the same way, and the clutch actually catches and engages in roughly the same place. Uh, the flywheel is a bit lighter on this, and the clutch is a little more heavy duty. So driving in slower situations, turning around, etc., it actually is a little more difficult to manage. <laughs> when you get that downshift right, oh my God. Our red line is about 8,100 RPM. Exactly, actually. <laughs> Let's go in for another heel toe. <laughs> it's a good day to be me. It's a really good day to be me. How does it drive? Well, as far as handling dynamics is concerned, pretty well. The tires that are actually on this are Snitto high performance all season tires. They're adequate. Uh, the owner doesn't really drive as hard as what we are doing today when we do car reviews. However, I feel a little bit of sidewall flex, but the way that it rotates is actually completely neutral and incredibly confidence inspiring. <laughs> Having a road like Wolf Creek, which is frankly mostly fast-paced sweepers, some winds, and uh, a couple of faster hairpins, this car is completely planted. It's, as far as the suspension is concerned, and I can tell whether it's a suspension thing or a tire thing, anything that I have to complain about handling-wise is tires. I would really love to see what this thing is like with some Pilot Sport 4S's.
throttle control is incredibly easy. Throttle control mid corner, it's very direct. The steering is also incredibly direct. It's one of the benefits of a mid engine platform. Uh, the longer control arms that you have, the fact that the wheels, they're actually a lot closer to you instead of a front engine car. Uh, the, ge the geometry of that it helps in your favor immensely. Brakes are actually a lot better considering the owner is replacing them very soon. They actually are at the end of their life and I'm able to dive pretty deep into the brake pedal before heel towing. The funny thing is this car, with it being a black R8, this has road presence. People have actually been pulling out of my way kind of left and right. And that's not something that happens very often in my Fiesta, in GT3s, in Lotus Elises. Not a whole lot gets as much attention as a black R8, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. Let's do another first gear pull, shall we? That's that gated manual. People herald the gated manual as a driving experience and where, yes, they are correct, the gated manual is not one that you can actually rush and hustle. The thing about a gated manual is where it's, yes, it's a very cool aesthetic as far as the sound, how it looks with the individual gates, the feeling, the clicking through each cog and gate. And it's cool, but it's not a fast gearbox. You actually can't really rush it. It's really more of a anywhere from four tenths to maybe six tenths as far as an intense driving experience. I'm kind of on a quest to figure out is how has this motor changed and evolved since the RS4? Because the RS4, it's not just that it's a similar 4.2, it's the same motor. How does this feel compared to the RS4? How does this car as a package, how does the gated manual feel with the conventional manual gearbox that's in the RS4? I'm not calling this a supercar. If you rewind, if you set back the clock to when I was a 15 year old in 2008 when this car came out, this might actually feel like a supercar because I hadn't been in any supercars really. Having driven GT3s, the Rossi on Q1, various Lamb other Lamborghinis, I've driven the V10 version of this very briefly. Having driven other supercars, I don't know if this still feels like a supercar. Here's where I would put this. It's the first dailyable exotic. Exotics and supercars tend to go together. And supercars tend to be exotic. So it would make sense. But I would peg this as the first, aside from the 911, dailyable exotic. I, I don't get the supercar performance vibe from this. <laughs> Uh, this car has not let me down yet as far as just being able to make me look back and go We're doing this. We're this is actually happening. This has been something that I've wanted to have happen since 2008 being able to hear the engine sound, you know bellowing and kicking off the the mountain walls here in Wolf Creek has been an absolute treat Yes, this R8 is one that, I, this and the next car that we're about to go drive is one that I, I need to work harder for. I think I need this. I think this might actually have to happen at some point. <sighs> Remember that time I drove an R8? I'm looking at it right now. Oh yes. <laughs> some laundry out of the way. This is a manual. You're right, Justin. Not just any manual, it's gated. It's a gated six speed. It's you know, gated. One of, the, uh, one of the drugs of choice for automotive enthusiasts. Yeah, and it's interesting because 
most drugs that automotive enthusiasts tend to gravitate towards have to do with more all out speed in general. Mm -hmm. uh, the gated manual is not that way. Uh, the gated manual is an experience and it's an experience that I want everyone, even everyone in this room to experience at some point in time. It's something that every car enthusiast I think should have a, at least a go and I put that up there with the R35 GTR, I put it with Miatas, yeah. I put it with uh, the Porsche 911. It's all kind of in that camp of like, if you're a car, th car enthusiast, you should at least have a go and experience and, it at least once. Yeah, and it's weird because as we, as he mentioned, like you actually can't really rush that gated manual that much. Um, it's not no. quite the same as driving a normal manual. Yes, it functions the same, but it functions the same as in there. Your right foot does gas and your left foot does clutch, and your hand does this. And you're, you go through an H pattern, but that's really where the similarities end. Yeah, you need to be a little bit more precise with this because obviously you're trying to fit that. You know the pull from the shifter into a gate. There is a Berlin wall that uh, goes around each of the <laughs> gates. Yeah, which you normally don't have. So in a normal car, there's a little bit of like wiggle room there for if you're just slamming from second to third, sure. you don't have this literal piece of aluminum. <laughs> Blocking the shaft, yeah. Yep, so you have to end up being a little bit more precise, but that's what gives it the fun. You end up, uh, you know, feeling like you're, as it's been so overplayed, but it's so true, Slotting a rifle bolt. It's, yeah. it, it is really yeah. what it feels like. I know it's an overplayed phrase, but it does feel like that. You, you feel the mechanical click that it, goes on. Especially if you're coming in hot into a corner and do a heel toe from fourth to third. Oh yes. Oh boy, yeah. And you nail it right. It yeah. does kind of teach you to be a better and more accurate manual driver. Well, the flywheel on that thing is so light mm -hmm. and the throttle response is just incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. There's just nothing quite like that experience. Top will, you know, put that in a basket with the fact that we mentioned before, this is among the first truly dailyable supercar type cars. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the owner that supplied the vehicle for us to, to drive uh, when we were out in Wolf Creek, yep. uh, that's his car. He has a Ducati. Yep. You know, he has a motorcycle that he drives or he rides, you know, on nicer days or when his car is in the shop or whatever. Yep. But the R8 is his car. Yeah. He, he dailies that. And he lives here in yeah. Utah. <laughs> so it does see miles. And that's, yeah. that's kind of a good, um, good benchmark for most of these cars. Most of them do see some miles. They do. They um, do. They do get driven. They're very common to see on road rallies because they're so comfortable. They have more luggage space than most. Um, mid-engine cars, right. you know, plus a parcel shelf in the back, comfortable seating for two, yep. you know, and it has just enough creature comforts to be nice with automatic AC and heated seats and all this. Right. And the engine is, you know, lovely. It's just, again, the same basic variant of the 4.2 as the RS4. Yep. Yep. It makes the same power and really just delivers that same experience of having an engine that you don't need to wait for which no. you know, is even more with the slightly lighter flywheel that the R8 has, as Gavin mentioned, is mm -hmm. even more pronounced in the R8, right. being that there's not as much unsprung weight going on with that crankshaft. Right, and who knows, we might have a go in a V10 uh, later down the road, but I, I personally have actually driven manual Gallardo and manual V10 yeah. R8. And what I can say is just the R8 package as a whole uh, it is a Gallardo, but turned down from 10 to about eight. Which as is far, honestly- As far as an experience yeah. is concerned. Um, yes, you can road trip Gallardos. I would rather much spend my time in that thing, for sure. Yeah, for a little, sure. more, little more comfortable and a little yeah. less Italian. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a bit. Yes, we, uh, yes, okay, hang on. I'm gonna stop people in the comments right there. Yes, Lamborghini was already owned by Audi. Yes, there was co-development Oh well, yeah, that happened cars. when Mercy came out, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, there was crossover between the cars. I get it that there is a lot of platforming that's shared between them. However, they are still vastly different cars. Absolutely. Um, but it's amazing. Like, um, this is also the only other car, despite the fact we talked about how the RS4 got more traction on social media, this is the only other car that really will pull a lot of traction on social media, ironically. It's one of those, the few cars where it's either Lambo, the hashtag Lambo, hashtag uh, R35, mm -hmm. hashtag GTR, like those kind of hashtags. Um, the R8 is right up there with it, and maybe it is because it's gone through a couple generations of car. It's also, um, it also made a debut in two movies, Iron Man and iRobot. 
That's true. People forget about iRobot. They do a little bit. But yeah, yeah, I mean that was that was concept vehicle with like circular wheels and shit. But like the basic body was but I mean, it, but similar. if you pull up to a gas station in that car, yep. you're gonna have ten year olds go, calling it the Iron Man car, calling it the Iron Man car, and wanting to sit in the seat, and that's cool. Yeah, there, there's not really much of a price you can put on that. Also, um, also PSA: if you own a supercar, you have to tell little kids that they can sit in the driver's seat. That you just have to. It's, 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 it's the law. It's <laughs> yes, it is <laughs> allegedly. Um, <laughs> but um, to touch on a couple last points, this car dynamically is great. Um, it is a great balance. Being an 8 out of 10 car, not a 10 out of 10 car, relatively speaking, it is comfortable. It it's does. It's easy to drive it, fast, though. It is so easy to it's, drive fast. It's really easy to drive fast. As far as the chassis is, is concerned and the dynamics of, of that, the, the gearbox is really the only thing that's holding it back from being a car you can just really pound on in the canyons. Yep, because that does take a bit of a learning curve. But other than that, it's a great, you know, even a great learning car. It's almost like a gateway drug to mid engined because it doesn't have it quite as bad of the like the faults of some mid-engine cars of you know really snap over steer or like when they're really pronounced right you know right. this is being a lighter engine in the back not like a large v12 or a v10 there's a little less weight back there to throw you around on you know snap over steer or things like that right um, it's super communicative and it's logical the way that it, its process goes when you think when you steer it steers, and if you're going a little too hard, it lets you know. It doesn't bite your head off. Well, and even uh, one of our assistants that was with us on the shoot, Derek, mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is a dream car of his, it's been a dream car of his for years, and this is the first mid-engine car that he's ever driven. Mm -hmm. And the owner, props, thank you, um, asked him if he'd like to have a go. And of course, he died crying and uh, said, yes. I mean, that made, that made his year, honestly. It did. But um, he was even able to, and he's like a Subaru guy. So like he's used to cars understeering. Derek being the type of driver that he is, yes, he was very careful, but he also is def more Clarksonian in his approach of a lot of things. A lot of meat fisted type of- you Your know. words, not mine. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he was even able to uh, to steer the car in such a way that it was neutral with just the very subtle hints of oversteer. Yeah, really nice little rear end rotation. And, and that's the first mid-engine car he's ever driven, by the way. Yeah. So It's extremely usable, even yeah. to a first time, you know, potential buyer dash driver. Right. And so it's, that's what leads it to its halo car status, is all the things we've talked about. It's a really well-rounded car, and highly recommend driving one and also looking at picking one up, because they can also be had for a good price. Depending on title status and transmission choice, they can be had for in, what, the high 40s even. Very high 40s if you're finding like a salvage one with an um, auto tragic R8 variant <laughs> with the single clutch. Right, um, right. But, I would highly recommend, uh, you know, even if you can find like, and I don't necessarily recommend salvage title ones, but if you can find a salvage title that you know the history on. Yeah, if you know you why, I mean, that goes for any car though. Mm -hmm. if you then can, if you get that with a gated manual, you could get a killer car for a good deal. You know what I kind of want to do though, is get one of those that maybe it is a salvage title and just front axle delete. <laughs> with the manual. Oh, come mm. on, come on. That just eliminates the point of the clutch. Mm. Anyways, whatever. Whatever, but there, there was a time when Audi had kind of already started to move on from this V8, from the R8 and RS4, and then decided to give us one last hurrah. The swan song, if you will. So keep in mind, the B8 um, S4 that debuted had a supercharged V6, which has been a very Audi staple ever since then. And to be fair, it is a fantastic motor in its own right. It has a lot of good to it. It's easily tunable. All the things that come along with being forced induction. However, part of our thing in here is naturally aspirated motors. And luckily, Audi did not go out on the low note. Hence, the RS5. Okay, Justin, this is it. This is the end. End of the line. Hello, Adele. Well, it definitely sings like Adele. This is the B8.5 RS5. And it is raunchy. So this is still the 4.2 V8. 
It makes 450 horsepower and it revs to all of 8,300 RPM. So to the moon for a V8. Oh my God, for a German V8, yeah. Oh man. For a cross-plane crank. I know. Yeah. That's pretty damn high. That's really high. And this is the only car in our lineup that has a dual clutch transmission. Yeah, it's interesting actually. We've really lucked out with our lineup because we have an executive sedan with a slush box automatic. We have a wagon. Oh, yeah. We have a sports sedan. In we manual. Have, in manual. Yep. We have a mid-engined gated six-speed car. Yep. And then we have this GT coupe with a dual clutch. And this thing is so ridiculously fast. I mean, I here I am in sport mode doing 40 miles an hour and just let me put, put my foot into it. <laughs> oh, so good. DSG farts are so much better when they're paired with a V8 that sounds like I this. know, I'm like PDK, like, yeah, that's a cool experience in sound. And DSG by Volkswagen is fine when it's in like Golf R's and GTI's and stuff. Yeah. But when you have a rumbly 4.2 V8, Oh! Here, fourth gear. Oh, but see, listen to that upshift. Listen to that. And the thing is, it also just handles it. It just takes corners. It just does whatever you ask of it, and it's a very German characteristic. And we are mobbing. <laughs> Filmed in Mexico. Oh, wow, that's a... Yeah, that, you, that's, that's, that, that's a Mexico speed. That's a speed right there. This is the last car in our lineup, the last car that had this sport tuned engine yep. in an Audi. This is the peak of the technology, the peak of the horsepower, yep. really the peak of the speed because... This is uh, so much faster than the R8. It is silly. It's weird because if you park these two, and actually maybe this could be a bit that we do later. Yeah. If we park these next to each other, on a street and, and ask get, people and ask people be like what do you think looks like it would be faster everybody like, would say the r8 except for maybe an informed few maybe <sighs> see i just went down four gears <laughs> see and here's the thing the the day we had um we had two of these cars together on one of our shoot days which is the r8 and this car yes going yes. up a canyon mm -hmm. the r8 couldn't leave this no no and the thing about the r8 too is that it, it has that gated manual and gated manual gearboxes are super cool and they're super rad, especially when they're in old like Ferraris and Lambos and stuff. Yeah. The thing is, they're not fast gearboxes. No. They're, they're not even fast for manual standards. They're just a classic driving experience. Yep. And they're amazing and I slight nobody. I would actually prefer an R8 in a manual gearbox in the, in the gated manual over the auto. Oh, 100%. Every day of the week. So now what I want to get into is the design, the styling, yep. and the agelessness of the B8.5 generation in general. Uh, I mean, even the A5s look really good and the A4s look, I think they still look good. I think they will age far better than any of the B9 cars. Yeah, and well, I mean, it, what's funny is that the B9 took this, this was the first fresh of this design where it became really angular. B9 yeah. took that, turned it up a little bit, which I agree, because this is in the middle of the two. And but this wasn't purely designed with the rectangle. Yeah. The, the body still has lines, it's just more of the lights are angular. Lights and the grills and, you yeah, know. Yeah, it's, it's still a bit geometric, for sure. The point that I really want to touch on is I personally identify with this generation of German vehicles in general. Look at the 981 Boxster. Uh, look at the 991, 911. At this time, the AMG GT had just come out. Just barely, yeah. Just barely come out, been uh, 2015. This year is actually, this is a 2016 car. Yep. I identify with these cars quite heavily, actually. So I, I'm a little biased in saying this, but I genuinely believe that this generation of Audi and this generation of uh, German car in general will age far better not just for the fact that it has a naturally aspirated V8 yeah. with the dual clutch, but because of how clean the interior is, how clean the body line is, how it isn't too heinously over aggressive. No, it looks pretty, especially in the silver, which is a beautiful color, by the way. You it, missed it, actually. On the way down to our shoot location today, we had a, a gentleman in uh, a murdered out uh, uh, Cadillac CTS, non-V, just a normal CTS. Yeah. It snapped his neck. Yeah. He was like passing us on the freeway because we were just chilling doing the speed limit 
Yep. As you all should do. So anyway, so this silver is a beautiful color. However, when you get it in a color like this, the lovely thing is when, it's, when you're a little bit further away from it, it hides really well. It's not mm -hmm. ridiculously overly shouty. And we do have to come clean on one thing with this car. It does have non-factory suspension. It's so good. Though. But it is, it, it's Olin's suspension, so yeah. it's properly dialed suspension. But, you know, realistically, the main difference this makes is just it eliminates some potential problems with active suspension and a few other things. But the ride's not vastly different. It actually isn't. And we need to come clean on something else as well. resonator delete which honestly makes it perfect we initially thought it was a massive aftermarket exhaust but no it's a stock exhaust simply with a resonator delete it's so good and it's perfect it's so good no drone but all the noises all the shout there is a little bit of rasp if you're getting really into it but it's not like it's a droney kind of thing but then he oh it's just the right amount where there's some theater oh. and it kind of gives you that uh fizzing sensation you know you know the one. So we did split these cars up with reviews is, is concerned pretty equally in between us. So I took the older cars because I've owned one. Right. And I know a lot about them and I love them for being what they are. Him being more of the sport fanatic. I like, I, I really gravitate towards sports and supercars. Yep. Uh, I mean, who doesn't love supercars? But no. like more so than Justin does. So that's kind of how we divvied it up. And But behind the scenes, yeah. Justin and I, and I have driven all of the cars pretty equally, I would say. Yep. This one, it was really hard to give away, and I've actually joked with the owner a couple of times of like, do I have <laughs> to actually give this back to you? Uh, because we we're fortunate enough to have actually taken this car for the day uh, on both occasions, and it's been amazing. So thank you to the owner for that. So I drove a 981 generation Cayman mm -hmm. last year. And so that's in like the 2014, 2016 era of uh, Porsche for the mid-engine cars, uh, Boxster and Cayman. So I drove that last year and that car, the big takeaway is I need to actually work harder in life so I can actually afford something like this because I need, I actually need that in my life. That Cayman spoke to me. And the thing is, I'm getting similar sensations from this car. And I don't know if it's because it's a German car from a company that I actually really, really like that was made at a similar time. And maybe I'm feeling that way, or maybe I'm feeling that way because like I can just go into manual and go from fifth, fourth, third, second, and just be a child. So where does that leave us? This, as we said in the beginning, is the pinnacle. This is the top. Luckily, they did something smart with this platform and this engine. They died when arguably, and honestly, unquestionably, it was at its peak. They right. didn't stop innovating it. This was, they, they didn't have an Elvis Presley uh, syndrome where there was definitely a downhill. There wasn't a trail <laughs> break going on. This thing yeah. actually died on this platform when it was legitimately at its best performance wise. And I couldn't think of a better way to go and I couldn't think of a better car to do it in. A two door sports coupe that is beautiful. And, and in every way, there's not a bad thing about this car, to be honest. No, I mean, if you want to get into the technical details, like, yeah, it's got a dual clutch, so it's gonna have to get service in a little while. And, yeah, cause it's like every, what, 60K yeah. service? It's, so. you know, you have to take care of it. It does, you know, need things like that. Yes, it is a two door, so it's not as practical as like the RS4. That is one thing it does give up, but the back seats are still usable. It's not Mustang back seats by well, any means. I know someone who's like, almost seven feet tall and he has a, a B8.5 S5. Yep. And like, that's his daily. Yeah. Everything about this car, the all wheel drive, the transmission, the engine, the suspension, everything about this that leads to this level of performance in a car that's so usable and dailyable like this, it is the pinnacle. It is the best of all of these cars. It's objectively the best. And we didn't go into this wanting to make a comparison and have no. a winner because like, yeah, in this case, the newest car is the best one. Thank goodness. And that's the only yeah. reason I'm mentioning it is that luckily when it died, when this lovely naturally aspirated V8 died and gave way to the forced induction that is the commonplace of today, yeah. it did so on a high note. It shouted its way out. Gavin? In a raucous roar. An 8,000 300, damn near 8,300 RPM. It 
it's so good. It's, I, I keep on saying it's so good. And this is something, this is honestly one of the experiences that I think everyone should actually have is experience a really high revving and buzzy V8. Oh. Whether it's a GT350, whether it's one of these, or even the RS4 and the R8 we drove earlier, which are still high revving by V8 standards. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to have this be a celebration of the fact that this was a thing. And it's not a thing that's gonna happen anymore. And this is actually one of those moments in, in time cars. This is, uh, it's up there with the 1M Coupe. Yep. It's up there with the E46 M3. Yep. Or like the 997 GT3s. Or, you know, even the E39, how, how popular like the E39 M5 was being the last of its kind to have a manual like that and yeah. perform like that with all of its glory. This car's special and it's gonna stay that way. And mark my words, you know, if these are around in 30 years, I have no doubt these will be hella collect collectible. They might even be collectible before then. They might be. I, I could definitely see it. I don't see these depreciating too much further than where they already are. And I've... <sighs> and see, I know you hate to hear that. <laughs> uh, I know, because the thing is, the current owner of this vehicle has had it for about six years, or five years yep. now. And he and I have had conversations of possibly moving on to some Porsche GT product for him. Yep. And it's too bad that he would want to do that sooner than I would want to buy this, because I want this, this one. This car. I don't want just any B8 and a half RS5. I want this one. But hopefully I can find one in the near future because I cannot spend too much time in this thing. Stay tuned. We'll continue to try to pump out as much as we can. And thank you for watching. And uh, we'll see you later. So we're gonna talk about time where Audi decided to summon demons with their cars and exhausts. <laughs> that brings in the RS5, which is a weirdly controversial car. Um, I even had a friend who on multiple occasions has seen people post about them on Facebook. And I've seen them be called, and I quote, asthmatic at altitude, which is nothing short of false. Um, <laughs> Fake news, slow, frankly. which is also not true, as we have proved. Um, and not, well, and I'll give them the not tunable part, because that kind of goes for any of these cars here without some moderately decent modification. I mean, that's naturally aspirated motors in general, but they might, your friend. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, friend. friend. Uh, they, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that they think that a car isn't fast unless if it is Hellcat swapped, LS swapped, is a Mark IV Supra with 2,000 horsepower. Or a B8.5S4 making like 700 wheel. I mean, that, you, I you mean, know, that like, is fast. Yeah, like crazy cars that like are sub, you know, 11 to 10 second quarter miles. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying they're wrong in saying that, that it's faster than this. This car is not slow. No, not even remotely. No, it's, it's faster than the R8. By, by a long shot. When we had yeah. we had this and the R8 on the same shoot day. Yeah. And I was in this. Gavin was in the R8 with the R. Um, I was like leisurely pedaling a six tenths, easily keeping up with the R8. <laughs> and I was working. And Gavin was working. Yes. I, mean, I wasn't going balls to the wall with the very first time driving the car with the owner in it, obviously. But uh, I, on a road that I actually know quite well and that you've never been on. He was probably pedaling eight tenths, I would say. Uh, uh, seven, like a, a strong seven. And you were probably a five and a half to six. Yep. Yeah. And it was, there was a lot left to go. So mm. let's get a couple things out of the way. This car has what the owner calls a Jesus exhaust. And that's not being weird. It was literally a man down at Master Muffler named Jesus. Correct. That chopped the factory resonators out, welded a pipe in there, and it sounds perfect. And called it a day. <laughs> no drone, no craziness, no nasty tones, a little raspy, but loud. And when you're not pedaling it, nice and dailyable. So how many times have we taken this car out for shoots? Because we've taken this, uh, taken out for the solo shoot that we did up in the canyons. Yep. We did, we've done two different group shoots. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another one and then today. Yeah. So it's like what, five, five, five times? Five different times. I have not grown tired of it once, frankly. <laughs> Yeah, and part of that is it's on, it's not on its factory, you know, magnetic type ride suspension. It's on the old. I, I was just talking about the, the oh. exhaust in general. Oh, yeah. No, we haven't gotten tired of like the drone or anything like that. There's the no the noise is quite literally perfect. No, it, I, 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 I laugh and cackle like a child every time I drive it. And, and then it does have the lovely feature of every time you start out. 
Oh, God. oh we, it's we, lovely. We cold started it this morning yeah. uh, at the owner's place, and it was just hanging at 1,500 RPM, just <laughs> little, little spits and spurts. and. Yeah, because the lovely thing is it's natural. It's not a crackle tune or anything like that. No, it's not synthetic. It's not like an F-Type or an Aventador. No, nope, it's real. It, it does exactly what it's meant to. Now, yep. so it has the exhaust modified. He does have some lovely HRU wheels on it, you know. Which are nice. Not right now. We're 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 in winter mode right now. Yeah, it's on full winter mode. When we right drove now. it earlier, had a set of what four thousand dollar HREs. Yep, and then it's yeah. on Olin's uh, adjustable dampers. Which oh, that just ties the room together, man. Which honestly, if there was a if there was an upgrade to this car overstock, that was it. Like to keep it perfectly dailyable, but. Oh my God, it handles so amazing. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, it's, it's that balance of handling and ride. And I proper actually, dampening. Oh, proper dampening. I was actually uh, doing a little cruise with him before we even have started doing this Audi project. Yep. Uh, he and I went for a drive through East Canyon. Mm -hmm. And I'm in my Fiesta ST and I think I'm hot shit, right? Because <laughs> it's me and I know that road super well and yeah. I know how that car drives. And on the uphill, he was behind me and I was you know, getting some pretty good lengths on him. Mm -hmm. And then the downhill came. And he left you. He was in the next county. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, actually. Yeah, yeah he was. <laughs> it is, it's, it's a car that we would actually put into a category above anything else in this room. Keep in mind, above the RS4 and the R8 as stupid fast. It's dumb fast. So fast that you don't realize by how easy it is handling the speed, how fast you're going. Well, and part of it has to do with the fact that um, you have 8,250 RPM to play with here. And a dual clutch. And a dual clutch. So the motor was cranked up. Now granted, this motor is different than even the original, uh, the R8 and the RS4 timing chain motors. Correct. This motor is slightly closer to, you know, what the V10s that went in the Lamborghinis were. Mm -hmm. There's very different, you know, intake and headwork going on. And 455 horsepower yeah. with that 8,250 RPM. And a balls to the wall type of acceleration that's is super linear. It actually oh, yeah. doesn't taper off really. No, um, <laughs> I did a poll this morning on the way over here and it took you quite a long time to get catch up to me like, <laughs> after I went back to the speed limit. Yes, and oh, man, it, it, it's, it is amazing. This is a great example of like, okay, there's only 30 more horsepower in this car than the other two cars over here on yeah. your left, but this is a prime example of what dual clutch transmissions do. Oh yeah, for, oh for sure. It turns the car up to 11. That was already like, yes, you can argue it's less of an experience and I'll agree with you on certain levels. There's not quite anything like pedaling a manual. I, I would say but, though, the, the, the matchup of the DSG farts that go along with this gearbox mixed with the snarl of that V8, is the best implementation that I've seen DSG get used in. Yeah, DSG sure. type, which Audi calls S-Tronic. Is that yeah. correct, Ben? It's S-Tronic? Is Ben taking a nap? What, it, sorry, Ben. Which, what is Audi's dual clutch called? Uh, DSG. It, yeah. is, it is DSG it, still? I, that's what I thought. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Or you can refer to it as like the, yeah, the, or S-Tronic. So it is S-Tronic. S-Tronic is kind of synonymous with the automatic. If you were to option S4, it would be an S4 with the DSG. Okay, cool. Interesting. Cool. Good so DSG. Um, and I think I can actually throw in another quote from the gentleman, Derek, that drove the R8 in our previous segment. Um, DSG farts sound so much better when the engine already sounds good. It's true, because, yes. any, because GTIs don't sound good. No. You can, you, yeah, yeah. They have their own little crowd, and they're good cars. They, but they, they, don't, they make good power for the size, but they, they, they don't, don't sound good. They don't sound good. So this sounds amazing. Oh, it sounds yeah, fantastic. Sounds phenomenal. Yeah. So you have all of this, this extra power, this you know, dual clutch, still quattro all-wheel drive, albeit a little bit different as far as how it splits the power, yeah. plus this loud exhaust in probably the most, um, you know interesting car of the bunch as far as packaging because it's a grand touring coupe it's not necessarily a sports car which is interesting because i tend to gravitate towards sports cars things like lotus elises porsche caymans miatas 911s and mm -hmm. gt3s and cars of that kind of crowd and demographic and uh taste i got the same feeling driving this car at the end of the first day that I got when I rented 
um, a Cayman S that with the six cylinder. Yeah. At the end of the day, I didn't. I a did not want to give it back. B had to give myself a long, hard, you know, internal monologue to of like, you need to work harder because <laughs> you need to get one of these. Yeah. And I, I'm not kidding. It is amazing. And so it, this is probably the most two-faced car in the bunch. Um, we've talked. I've two-faced meant, in all the best ways, though. Two-faced in it's all the a, best Jekyll ways. Jekyll and Hyde. You situation. turn it down, you know, and just you leave it in automatic mode. You leave everything in cushy mode, and it is perfectly capable with just a little bit of noise going around on day-to-day -day tasks. It has a large trunk and a slightly usable back seat. It's not great, but it's better than a Mustang back right, seat. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or a Porsche back seat. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But then if you just flick it over into dynamic mode, flick the uh, gear selector over into manual, pull a couple paddles, it turns into an outright demon. You don't even have to pull paddles. You can be in seventh gear. And just plant. And you can jump down five gears. Yep, like that. Yep, just like the GT3 that we drove last year, just like you know other dual clutches that we've driven in the past. It, it really just changes the character of the car completely to just this amazingly usable yet scary car. <laughs> it's scary, but it's so secure. It's, it scares time. you just enough to where you want a lot more. It's like, really good. <laughs> <laughs> I've driven, I've hit higher speeds in this car on roads that I already know mm -hmm. than I kind of thought were possible with the car that weighs this much. And, like, and you, the thing is, you don't feel the weight necessarily, yeah. but you definitely feel the real estate and the size of how large, how big the footprint of the car is. It has quite a presence. It is quite, you know, large. It's not a small car. It's not a small car. It also has road presence for it, sure. Yeah, it is a very, very good car to see on the road, yeah. like in person. And mm -hmm. it, it definitely keeps those things going as you're moving. And oh, just, uh, we can't speak enough about this car. Honestly, like like I said, this is a very controversial car. There are a lot of people that like to call this out because this was the end of the era. This was the point where Audi had more or less moved on to all most of its lineup, if not all, having forced induction in one way, shape, or form, except for the base models in you know a right. couple cars. Right. It was the world had already moved on when this car was released. Mm -hmm. You know the the trend had already been set to more efficient and quote unquote better means of developing power. This is, you know, Audi, you know, <laughs> kind of the way that I was thinking about it when we were first writing up, you know, scripting this yeah. and developing all this, was yeah. this is like grandpa that chose the perfect moment to retire. Instead of just like the, you know, the exact time when people told him he should retire, he's like, nope, I'm gonna wait five more years. I'm gonna double my investment per portfolio returns. I'm gonna retire on a high note, but just before I start to lose my grace. Right. So I'm waiting that extra five years. I'm gonna do it better. I'm gonna really like sing my heart out, show these little guys who, who's boss in this company because I've been here longer than they've been alive, but I'm gonna retire before any of them can ever beat me, before I lose my gusto and start to actually act asthmatic and an old man. That's exactly what Audi did here. They, you know, I, I think somebody in Audi internally and nobody, I haven't seen a report on this or anything, but I think somebody in Audi internally wanted to send off this engine with a cliffhanger. It's a, it's a perfect swan song for the for the car. With with it's it's taking the best of the interior refinement and uh, kind of the longevity of that design language. Yep, it's taking that mixed with a dual clutch. Yep, uh, which is you know maybe some reliability maintenance records aside, the yep. perfect gearbox. Quote unquote. Yep, uh, with a super high revving. Gorgeous sounding, uh, linear but torquey engine. Yep. Because it's not just like a 911 motor where it's all sing up top and no, nothing down low. It still has torque. No, it still it's, launches good. Uh, launches or just you know cruising in the mid range. You don't you don't have to really work for your speed that much at all. Yep. And then combine that with all of the best technologies that could at the time. You know, their extremely large brake package. Their you know adaptive ride suspension. Mm -hmm. um, all of the normal creature comforts that you find in an Audi, such as heated seats, a lovely stereo, Bluetooth at the time, you know, this is really the um, first car that, that really started to become a thing is right in this era with Audi, because prior to that with the older MMIs, you could get it, but it was an option that was not implemented well. Right. Um, plus, you know, you, you just label all this together and you can tell that they wanted to send it out. And that's interesting because you can tell by the fact it's controversial that it had already surpassed its prime, but they wanted to nail a coffin. They wanted to put it out good yeah. put it out to pasture good and not not let people down so 
That kind of leaves us with a weird point in time. This car left us in around the 2015-2016 era was the last time these cars were sold new. So we have to think, if you were shopping in that era, what would you have chosen? What, you know, when this engine was gone, what was left on the table from other manufacturers? I feel like you're about to tell me. <laughs> as, so, as I gracefully yeah, turn my page. page. <laughs> So we, we did put together a small list of like things that either started or were around this era. Um, we had GT350, which was also naturally aspirated, similar to these cars. It revved, had same red line, uh, it had a, 80 more horsepower or something like that. It was yep. 520 horse. Yep. We had the F80 M4, which yeah. at, by that point had already long gone to forced induction. Yes. Um, we had STI hatch and the Evo both died at around the same portion of time that this car did. Right, because the 2014 STI hatch was the last you could get it. Mm -hmm. And the final edition uh, Mitsubishi Evo 10 was 2015, I believe. Mm -hmm. We had uh, at this time, we've already mentioned that this was when the 3OT came out and became a big thing for Audi. Um, when well, the 4OT, uh, uh, yes with BMW and yes with uh, Mercedes as well. Yep. And Audi. Yep, and you know, by this time, ironically, the 4OT was already out when this car was made. Yeah, because the RS7 had it mm -hmm. and the S6. Yep, and you know, uh, arguably an ex a virtually extremely different V8, not even comparable, not even just because of the fact that it is forced induction. Um, then you did have a few cars that still had uh, like NA, such as the SRT8 Challengers. Yep. You had the you know Z51 Corvettes. Yep. You had uh, the Ferrari 458. And then this time you also had the weird experimentations that we started to get with uh, the holy trinity of hypercars. Well, and that's, that's just more of a, a testament to where technology was at at the time because mm -hmm. you had Ferrari with a naturally aspirated yep. V12, but it had a hybrid assist. You had Porsche, that was a four liter, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is it a four liter V8? I believe so. With, yeah. In the 918, and yep. then the uh, McLaren P1, that was also a four twin liter. Twin turbo, yep. Yeah, but still a four liter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you could already, you can see by this list, it's weird. We still have a couple things mixed in that are naturally aspirated, some of which are V8s like this. Yep. But the world had clearly moved on. Yep. And so, you know, that leaves us with a conundrum. Us as enthusiasts love that natural tendency of not having a turbocharger or a supercharger in the way, depending on what your goal is. It makes the experience more, more raw. You know, I can, it's arguable as to whether or not it's more refined, but like, it gives a natural sensation of yep. how the power is developed yep. and a more direct connection with your foot and with every input that you give the car. Again, big reason why the RS4 is such a heralded car. Mm -hmm. It's the end of an era. And this is lamented on by every journalist, by pretty much by a good selection of enthusiasts. And it's an era that, to be honest, we will never see again. Well, I mean, electric cars in general are you know posing a huge threat to uh, internal combustion in general, and and you're seeing kind of this uh, another of this one last hurrah with the internal combustion engine in general. Look at you know the Elephant crate engines you could buy through FCA. Yep. Look at the Z51 or sorry the ZR1 yep. uh, Corvette with 755 horsepower. We don't even know what the C8 CR. ZR1 is going to actually be. And even the crazy things like Koenigsegg experiment with a 600 horsepower three cylinder. Yeah, the free valve system is pretty mm -hmm. insane too. So uh, we're really reaching this era. And to be clear, we do, we're not opposed to electric cars. We do love them, but oh, we yeah. do we do have to just realize that like the, the world is moving on from, you know, it's already moved on from natural lay aspiration effectively, except for in, you know, basic regular cars. Basically Porsche is w like one of the one last car companies that are holding on to naturally aspirated to motors. performance naturally aspirated motors yeah because right. even even most of your basic honda civics and stuff these days come turbocharged with like 1.4 liters mm -hmm. but because of emissions because of efficiency you know anything you can name and just the tunability that comes with having induction be forced as well as the you know not having power loss altitude there's many benefits oh sure this is gone and, and th those benefits come at a price though. Generally that price is most of the time reliability. You have yeah. a lot more components that can fail, a lot more breaking points. Um, there's a lot more stress on the engine. Also, um, but there's also the soul and the passion that comes with these cars. Yeah, it's, it's something that will be missed as cars get more, you know, we'll call it, you know, designed in a lab and engineered versus just kind of thrown together for GT40 style and beat the shit out of Ferrari. 
it, we are going to see it gone. And so I want to leave this on a note where we need to do one thing. As enthusiasts, we need to realize two things. Number one, the world will move on with electric or hybrid or anything that we've mentioned, even just basic turbocharging like we're currently in the middle of. Downsized turbos, yeah. Mm -hmm. Number two, we need to accept that, but also make sure that we remember all of this stuff like what came before. This was the end of the old fashioned era of you make things better and bigger and it just works you know, with, you know, a bigger motor that goes in a car. We need to make sure to remember this and always fight to make sure that like, you know, these don't get, for instance, outlawed or anything like that, which, cause who knows what can happen in the next 30 or 40 years. I mean, there's actually a human driving association that is basically doing that. Yeah. To try, trying to keep people and drivers in the driver's seats of cars. Mm -hmm. And, and we, so with this connected driving experience you get with these cars, please, the next time you're like thinking about, you know, your next automotive choice or, you know, at the time, you know, like in the next 10 years, a couple of these cars at least might become collectible-ish. You never know where the market's going to go. Yeah, yeah, you um, know. They'll be reaching their, you know, 20 plus year point and we'll start to get to that, you know, point where you never know how they're going to become. Please remember that these existed and that um, there's a lot to be had with these cars. It, on a note that's similar, uh, you like a car that is being sold now, and if you have the ability to do so, go buy it. Enjoy your experience. Right, I even if you have to take that depreciation loss immediately because car companies build cars for money. And right? they generally build them once. They, sometimes, yes. Yes. Uh, the Supra, <laughs> looking at that, the 400Z, these cars that are coming out now, the C8 Corvette, um, and some people are, you know, kind of, complaining about how they're not exactly the way that our they were. <laughs> our, well, they either were or our fantasies uh, made them out to be in our own heads. And so we're like, oh, well, I would rather just buy a 30 year old chip box instead. Yeah. Where um, we need to actually buy cars when they come out so they can keep on getting made. And hopefully keep some, you know, work with the engineering to keep some spirit alive, even with the modern regulations and stuff. So we do need to make a couple honorable mentions here. Number one. Look at where we are. <laughs> we are in Utah Motorsports Campus, specifically in an old display building. Um, we need, could not thank them enough for being willing to provide this space because there is not a better space that I could have imagined parking five cars in to do a shoot like this. No, this, is ac this was the goal. Like our, this was actually goals. And on our last shoot, uh, one of the suppliers of one of these fine automobiles uh, offered uh, a space out here to shoot at and of course we said yes so we're, we're, we, we, may, we may be dumb but we're not stupid exactly <laughs> and we need to just anybody that's in the local utah area or even surrounding outside of that remember that we have a effectively world-class facility here we do. that we need to continue to support to yeah. keep here to keep stuff like these cars and events like this alive i can't think of a safer way to actually test the limits of your car, not just safety to you, but also safety to your car, uh, than coming out here if you live in Utah. Um, um, wide open Wednesdays. Wi wide open Wednesdays and and wow, or wide open weekends is what they're I think calling it now. Yep. And and wow plus. Yep. Um, it's cheap. It's sixty five. Sorry. It's. I, I'm getting really passionate about this. I can tell. Uh, it's <laughs> sixty five bucks and then you know plus a helmet and you, open track. It's yeah. it's all yours. Yeah. The world is your oyster. Yeah. Secondly, we need to thank all the owners of these cars who have graciously helped us with, uh, you know, as the state of the world is right now with everything going on, mm -hmm. I, don't, I need not mention, if you can look at when this video came out, you know what's going on. Yep. Um, we, they have been nothing short of generous as well as helpful in every way in trying to help us do this shoot because it has been a struggle trying to maintain continuity with shots and trying to just get everybody in the same place at one time. I mean, the time. schedules of five different cars and owners alone is, you know, it, it, it's a lot. It's a it, lot. And it's a we, lot. We haven't done this before, really. This is our first big shoot like this, and so you can imagine any of you that have done productions of styles like this, the logistics that are involved, you know, pretty much double every single time that you involve another person. And finally, we'd like to thank all of you viewing this because this is effectively a feature length film. You can look down at the bottom to see the exact length as I sitting here don't know it, but I know it will be a pretty decently long film because we wanted to do the owners, the cars, as well as just this engine justice. Right, we, we wanted to actually make it worth our while in order to 
make something like this happen. Uh, but yes, this is uh, a feature length film that's taken quite a bit of logistics in order to accomplish. And uh, we appreciate each and every one of you who have supplied a car, who have helped us with the shooting location, who have helped us uh, either run sound or drive camera car or um, provide food, provide food or just deal with me being a diva. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, there's been a lot that's gone into us. Yeah. And so we want to wish Everybody a new year. We want to hope yeah. that like, you know, conditions improve, that, you know, we still get to experience cars like this, yep. that companies stick around, that locations like this stick around, yes. and that people stick around. Yeah. So without further ado, thank you for watching and have a good morning, evening, or night, wherever it is when you're watching this. Thank you. Well done. Thank ha you. Hashtag branding. Thank you. <laughs>